Christ is risen. He is risen. On May the 26th, we remember among the saints, uh, Carpus, who was one of the 70 disciples, and who was mentioned by St. Paul in one of his letters to Timothy. And in addition, there's a letter from St. Dionysius the Areopagite about a trip to Crete, where he saw Carpus and said he was very clear, he had a very clear mind, and by God's grace, Carpus was most worthy of seeing visions, and he never began the Holy Liturgy unless during the preparation, when he was reading the prayers, some sacred and propitious vision appeared to him. Now, Carpus told Dionysius that he had once felt bitter because an unbeliever had enticed a Christian away from the church and turned that one into an atheist. And while he felt this bitterness, Carpus didn't pray as he ought to have done for both men. And he didn't ask for God's help so that the one who had been enticed into disbelief would return to the faith, and the one who had enticed him away from the faith would come to know Jesus Christ. And nor did Carpus take the decision to admonish the two of them, to bring them to divine knowledge. But Carpus added that he never had experienced such a thing before, that he went to bed and fell asleep, feeling frustrated and with bitterness in his soul. And he went on to say that he went to sleep as soon as night fell, about midnight, though. He woke to sing the hymns at that time, as he customarily did. But for the hour of prayer, he was worried when he should not have been. And he was worried about the thought of the atheists in the world, perverting the holy and straight paths of the Lord. And with this thought in mind, Carpus prayed that God would set loose a thunderbolt and burn up the two, the one who had fallen away from the faith and the one who had led him away, without mercy. And while he was praying this, it seemed to him that suddenly the whole house shook and split in two parts, from the roof to the foundations, with a blazing fire which started in the heavens and reached down right in front of the house. The heavens seemed to open, and the Lord Jesus was seated there, surrounded by countless angels in human form. This is what Carpus saw when he looked up in wonder. But when he looked down, he told Dionysius, he saw the ground split below him with a gap that was limitless and pitch black. And at one edge of the mouth of this chasm, he saw the two men he had cursed shortly before, standing utterly miserable and in sheer terror, since they were in immediate danger of falling into the pit because their legs could hardly support them. And from the depths of the pit emerged snakes, which wrapped themselves around the men's legs and dragged them forward and went after them with their fangs and taunted them with their tails. And it seemed as if the two men were really close to falling into the pit, either because of their own despair or because of the attacks of the snakes. Carpus said that he was glad when he was looking down, while he took no notice at all of what was in heaven, and was increasingly distressed that the two hadn't fallen into the pit and he often attempted to accomplish it, and that when he did not succeed in kicking them into the pit, he was both irritated and cursed. And at some point, 
Carpus lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he saw Jesus as he had been before. And he saw the Lord get up from his throne and descend not to Carpus, but to the two men to show them mercy and extend a hand of help. Messiah Jesus took the angels with him, and they assisted the men, some taking one and some the other, so they wouldn't fall into the pit. And while Carpus's hand was extended yet to strike the two men, to send them into the pit, Jesus got in between. And he said, go on, Carpus, strike me. I'm still willing to suffer again and many times more for people's salvation. But before you do, look and see if you judge it wise to go into the chaos with the snakes rather than be in heaven with God and his good and loving angels. This letter never ceases to fill me with wonder at the mercy of Christ and at the extent to which we should never judge or will wish anything ill on anyone. Some points that stand out to me, Carpus takes off his mind from himself. Instead, he looks outwardly. He's worried about someone else's sin, not about his own. He no longer sees scripture as written for himself, as each of us should read it, but he sees it as written for others and how they ignore it. And he takes God's place as judge. And this leads him to being embittered towards the two persons, so that his prayer becomes one of judgment, praying that God would strike them down. And Carpus takes pleasure in their torment. We humans even have a word for it in German, Schadenfreude, shadow joy. When we see something bad happen to somebody we don't like, there's that inner, inner tingle of joy. Ah, they're getting theirs. Carpus took pleasure in the torment of these men. And so he took his mind off the things of heaven. If our heart is not on the things of heaven, it will be in the wasteland. Carpus is disappointed that the two persons do not fall into the pit, so he strikes them. And when he goes to strike them again, most outstanding of all, Christ himself descends from his throne and places himself between Carpus and the two unfortunates, telling him, Carpus, strike me for I am always willing to suffer again and many times more for people's salvation. To seek to bring anyone to judgment is to open the abyss for ourselves rather than for that person. And on top of it all, if we do, Christ himself comes to their aid. As St. Dionysius writes elsewhere, is it not true that Christ draws near with love to those who turn away from him, that he struggles with them, begs them not to scorn his love, and if they show only aversion and remain deaf to his appeals, becomes himself their advocate before his Father. Such is the God we worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to whom be glory the ages. Amen.